Okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. <clears throat> and I'm going to be going over the you know, short little uh, five-game main we have here on Thursday. Getaway day. Um, figured we'd try and get something up today since I wasn't able to do anything yesterday. Um, so we'll just quickly kind of go over the short five-gamer we have here. Not going to try and not yap for a freaking hour or, everything, or anything like that and just get it up. Um, we've got, uh, three kind of aces here, if you want to call them aces. Um, on the mound, they're going to garner most of the ownership. Guy in the mid-range, Logan Allen, gets Oakland. He's going to garner a lot of, um, a lot of the ownership there. I think we can make some pivots here. Uh, so let's just get into the games. Um, you know, we got a lot of really interesting offensive spots I think we can get to as well. This this first game here is one of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, Atlanta and Philly, Bryce Elder is going, and Nola on the other side. Um, I want to go after Bryce Elder still, man. I think this price tag's too high in this particular matchup. Now, the ground ball stuff is still very high, at least to the right side of the plate. Um, and it, it's incredibly efficient there. But there's still a lot of noise in his numbers. He's got a 260 ERA with expected metrics, a run, a run and a half higher. Okay, he's got an 84% strand rate with just a 27% CSW and a 21% K rate. Now, the swing strike rate is above 10%, but it's just 11%. It's not all that impressive. A 27% CSW is not you know, world-beating or anything like that. He doesn't walk anybody, right? And he stays off of the barrel. But just because it's not technical barrel contact does not mean that it's not loud contact. I mean, this is a this is the highest uh, pitch info hard contact rate in baseball for a starting pitcher. And with expected metrics suggesting that he should not be suppressing as well as he does, right, not leaving as many guys on base as he does, this contact rate, it... It's persisted for a huge sample here. And don't get me wrong, the strand rate and the ground ball rate, all that stuff has persisted as well. But contact rates converge uh, a hell of a lot um, quicker, right? And they're a more reliable statistic than something noisier, like a strand rate, or, or even a run suppression, suppression metric, you know, like an ERA or anything like that, right? Now, the whip, that's going to be similar to a, a, a contact rate, similar to a strike one rate, in that it's going to, um, you know, like every single inning you throw, this is going to get calculated, right? But a first pitch strike rate, for example, is going to converge a little bit faster. Um, so he's super efficient, right? Because he still gets a lot of ground balls. He's got a fine arsenal, that keeps him down in the strike zone, two-seamer slider change. Against the righties, throwing the two-seamer is a pretty damn good pitch if you can keep it down in the strike zone. We mention this all the time. This is only a good pitch if it, if you can stay down with it, right? And he certainly does that, 4-0, ground ball to fly ball, to the right side of the plate. Slider is also very good, keeps that down in the strike zone, and he buries it. Same with the changeup, right? And that helps suppress a little bit of the power that he would otherwise give up if he were not, or if he were throwing just a two-seamer, um, or mostly just a two-seamer, to opposite-handed hitters. That said, he's still giving up a lot of hard contact here, too, on the two-seamer. And his ground ball to fly ball ratio is nowhere near as high. He's much more on a line here, just a buck thirty-five ground ball to fly ball to the lefties, with a 20% line drive rate, right? 37.5% hard contact rate to lefties, 160 ISO allowed, 21% K rate. All right, so these are far closer, the numbers against lefties, to league average, right? It's just that he's he's been so good against right-handers in keeping the baseball down, and naturally, most lineups that you're going to face are right-handed heavy. Well, that's not necessarily the case here with Philly, right? I mean, obviously, they've got Trey Turner, Castellanos, JTR, Alec Bohm, right? But they still have five lefties in here. Two of them are pretty damn good, I'd say. Kyle Schwarber, Bryce Harper, right? Bryson Stott is not a slouch. And Brandon Marsh, he's cooled off quite a bit, right? 
um, come back to Brandon Marsh historical levels. But he and Cody Clemens down at the bottom of the lineup also very respectable from the left side of the plate. Um, and they can get after Bryce Elder here, right? These guys can get the baseball on the line a little bit. Certainly Schwarber is a very high fly ball hitter, as is Harper, right, against right-handed pitching. So this is bad ball-wise, not necessarily the best matchup for Bryce Elder here. And honestly, I think he's overpriced. Now, I do like this ownership here on a five-game slate. This is just a five-gamer. We can do whatever the hell you want. Because he's still going to be able to break up um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of these lefties, unless Philly just comes at it and just goes very lefty heavy. Um, pretty unlikely though. They're going to have Trey at the top of the lineup. They're going to have Castellanos up near the top of the lineup in some capacity, right? JTR is not going to be lower than the six hole. He might not start. Who knows, right? But that would put Garrett Stubbs in there. Um, and he is from the left side, right? I believe it's Garrett Stubbs. Uh, so, you know, like, <laughs> they could very well go with six or even seven left-handers here against Bryce Elder, guys that can't get the um, the baseball on a line and get it in the air here and attack the far more average figures, right? And as we've mentioned a few times this season, Nick Castellanos actually has better numbers against right-handers over the last couple of seasons than he does lefties. Hits for more power, hits for more average, right? And he's not going to strike out a hell of a lot, and Bryce Elder's not going to strike out a lot of guys, right? So I think he's attackable here, and it makes sense to me that the that the ownership, at least compared to the other guys that we've got on the slate, Nola, Blake Snell, in the same price range, is a little bit lower, right, at just 12%. Makes him a fine tournament play, because he still has suppression in him, you know, like even a 370 XFIP here is not a 470 or 570 XFIP or something like that, right? It's still a pretty damn good figure overall. But I think he's attackable, and Philly is really not popping in, certainly not in value score, because every damn one of these guys is pretty expensive. Schwarber, 56, Turner, 6,000, Castellanos, he's the most well-priced uh, at 4,300. I like this price tag a lot. Uh, Harper is 62, JTR is 57. So you want to get to Trey Turner and JTR in a down matchup for them at those price tags? Yeah, probably not, right? Not my favorite plays there. But I do like getting to these lefties here and a little bit of Nick Castellanos to uh, balance things out for you a little bit. So those are good plays. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have literally probably stacks of every single team here today and most of the arms. Uh, and that includes Bryce Elder. So I think he's fine in tournaments. Uh, if you're building a lot of teams, uh, I'm probably going to build a bunch today. So, um, you know, I, I think mixing him in and, well, I, let me say it a different way. I think totally fading him is probably not a great idea because overall, Philly still just a pretty average offense. 103 WRC plus, they'll, they'll whiff a little bit. They're going to walk, yeah, with Schwarber up at the top. 150 ISO, 31% hard. It, it's average pretty much everywhere. But they will get the baseball on a line here in a sneaky fashion, 22%. Right? So I think, uh, you know, we might have some weather concerns here. Um, but that aside, I think this is a fine spot for some Philly. They're not going to be popular at all. Right? They're one of the best offense they got some of the best hitters here and this is only a five game slate so if you don't have exposure to philly i think that's a mistake right i think it's also a mistake to not have some bryce elder but not as large a mistake right so Aaron nola on the other side he's seen 40 percent ownership right now and i i don't know like if i'm building teams literally right now i think i have to come in under this figure um i don't i don't know how it works it, it would work exactly in builds because you know, I would like to come in under on uh, Blake Snell, who we'll get to as well. But, you know, this makes it hard for me. I think Aaron Nola is pretty much average. Um, he's got some K stuff, maybe he's starting to figure it out. But, like, he's got a lot of history against this team. And he is, for the most part, pretty marginal against them. He'll pop for a big score every now and then because the Braves, historically have had some serious strikeout problems. Look at this damn strikeout right now. It's under 
Over the last month, month and a half, Atlanta, they are seeing the baseball and it's every single one of them. They've had some good matchups against some bad pitching staffs. Um, and Aaron Nola does, you know, certainly not in that category, right? Aaron Nola is not bad, but he's average, right? Where's the value on the curveball for him? Where's the value on a changeup? Two-seamer is still good, right? But he's moved a lot of this over to the four-seamer now, which is hovering around relatively break even to the rest of the league, right? He's giving a lot of this two-seamer value and this four-seamer value right back in the cutter, right? So he's not really getting all that much value out of the fastball mix. And then you've got a break-even change and a break-even curveball. These two pitches have historically made Aaron Nola a lot of money, right? So I think he's just average for the most part. He still doesn't walk people, right? The control is great. But this is not 30% K rate Nola anymore, right? He does have a super, super low strand rate, 62%. So when guys get on base, he's just allowing them to you know, circle the base pass, come around and score here. So this number should come up for Aaron Nola. But this is a very difficult matchup against the hottest offense in baseball right now. I mean, it's every one of them that's hitting the baseball out. It's it's Michael Harris. It's even Orlando Arcia in good matchups. Down at the bottom of the lineup, Eddie had a killer series against Colorado, right? And... I mean, really, the only down spot in their lineup right now is Ronald Acuna at the top, who is not... I mean, like, Braves in their series against Colorado, they put up, I think, 45 runs or, or thereabouts in three games. Four games, I think it was. And Acuna didn't have a single extra base hit in that series, right? So it's all the other guys that are still doing it, right? And when that happens... It's these numbers that start to really eke to the surface, right? Buck 12 WRC plus, 9% full walk rate, 22% K rate, as we mentioned now, right? 198 ISO with 36% hard contact against right-handers. Uh, Aaron Nola is an above-average righty still, right? Still not going to give up a, a lot of hard contact necessarily, but he's mostly on a line, right? He's a neutral ground ball to fly ball anymore, that's not throwing it past people at the same 28 and 30% clip that we've seen in the past, right? He's just not getting the value out of the secondary pitches that create those whiffs for him, right? And look at the realized ISO numbers, 181 to the lefties, 187 to the righties. Those are two attackable figures. He's got a 172 X ISO, right, with a 300 X wall, but that's a good number. 234 XBA, that's a good number. But the 172 X ISO is a little bit attackable, and that's Atlanta strength. Right, so with depressed strikeout rates for Nola, it's still one of the better numbers on the day, but it's still only about fifth, fourth or fifth on the day. Right, there are other guys with higher strikeout rates than Aaron Nola, and he gets the worst matchup of all of them. So at this particular ownership figure, I think I would probably end up coming in just underweight, uh, even on a five-game slate. Like I said, it's going to be hard to get a lot of leverage with pitchers on the mound on such a short slate. Um, but I think this is one of the spots where you could consider trying to get a little bit of leverage, come in under the field here on NOLA against the best offense on the day, certainly, um, and then try and get a little bit different with your hitters, perhaps play the Phillies, right? Something like that. Um, these guys are all... Very expensive. Everybody, every hitter in this game, right? Acuna 66, Albi's 5,000, Riley 55, Marcelo Zuna's not necessarily. He's a 4,000, but Matt Olson's still 6K. Hits 220, but just hits the ball over the wall, right? That's why he's so expensive, and he walks a lot. Um, Travis Darno probably going to be behind the plate. He's 4,600, right? And this is a difficult matchup because historically Aaron Nola has been good, but this season, not so much. Right, very up and down. He's still going deepish into games, but this is a dangerous matchup. So I think not having, you know, just clicking in a ton of Aaron Nola here and not having any of the Braves on the other side, I think that's a big mistake. I think that's a big mistake. So 
uh, fading both of these offenses here, despite the fact that they're not popping in value, they're expensive. I think it's a huge, huge leak if you do this on a five-game slate. So I won't be doing it, um, and I hope everybody else does, and both of these guys get blown apart, and I get leverage. Okay, let's move on. Tommy Henry and Jake Irvin for Arizona and Washington. I really like offense here. Um, really from both sides, as a matter of fact. Tommy Henry, I love going after this kid. 15% K rate. He's got a 9% walk rate, 8% barrel rate. Those numbers are fine. 32% chase, that's a good figure, right? He's got decent braking stuff and off-speed stuff. Um, but he still gives up pop, right? And he pitches to a lot of contact, 78% here. He's got a 465 ERA with an XFIP, about, you know, a run higher nearly. Looking for more contact against him. Now, I do like 6,200. I don't like this matchup against the Nationals because they don't strike out, man. He's got a 15% K rate, as, as we mentioned, and the Nats here are at an 18% aggregate K rate themselves. They're not going to create a hell of a lot, but they're sneaky, right? They make contact. They get the baseball on the line. 22% aggregate line drive rate. Not going to hit the baseball out of the, pol- the ballpark, right? And it's a little bit cooler here in Washington t- today. So not super thrilled about um, major Washington stacks, but they're popping very hard in value, mostly because they're cheap, but they still have a good bit of upside in this particular matchup, right? Now, Tommy Henry, it's only going to be 12% owned, so I think that puts him in play in tournaments against a you know, a pretty average offense and a low upside offense, but they're not going to strike out. If he gives up any production, which is pretty likely here, I mean, he does still have a 465 ERA, you know, pretty likely for him to get tagged for a couple runs. It's going to be super difficult for him to make that back up, right? Um, 17% K rate to the righties here, is not going to wow anybody, right? And he's actually having a little bit of trouble throwing it past the lefties, too. Short sample, definitely. Uh, but he's given up some average, right? And he also has a 178 X ISO, 330 X Woba, 250 X BA. So I think he's attackable. Um, certainly with a couple of these very high upside righties that hit lefties well, Lane Thomas, Stone Garrett in particular, Jamer a little bit. Um, you can play Caber behind the plate. Not a lot of power upside necessarily, but he's 3,000. It's fine. And this is a five-game slate, so go ahead. Um, so I like a little bit of the Nationals here going after Arizona and Tommy Henry. Jake Irvin on the mound, I'm not going to be – this is one of the few guys I'm, I'm just not going to touch. Uh, I want as much Arizona as I can get. Unfortunately, they are going to be the most popular team on the day. Uh, I think they're the best stack, and – I think they're in the best spot. Um, this team really capitalizes. We've actually got their lineup having rolled in already. Um, this team really capitalizes. You know, why don't we uh, just kind of scroll all the way over. Um, give you a little peek behind the uh, hitter paywall projection-wise. Here's their ownership figures, right? They're going to be very popular. Certainly the top five guys. Uh, everybody down at the bottom of the lineup, you can differentiate a little bit. But like 10% ownership, that's still you know, not nothing, right? Um, This team really capitalizes on below average right-handed pitching, right? You really see them excel. They don't strike out. They create it at a 110 clip. They've got guys literally top to bottom that will steal bases. Jerry Perdomo leading off here. Cattell Marte's got some speed. Of course, Corbin Carroll, right? And Alec Thomas has speed down here. Um, you know, they're missing like a Jake McCarthy who's got a little bit of speed as well. But they've got four guys here that will run. Walker, Gurriel, Manny, Nick Ahmed, Carson Kelly, not so much. But they can create here. They don't have to just hit the baseball. Well, good for them. They they could do both, right? Because they make a lot of contact. It's good loud contact, right? Very little soft here at 14%. That's an excellent figure. And they hit for some power, right? So they've got a really, really equitable combination here of power, speed, and contact that makes them incredibly dangerous to go after. And despite a 5,500 price tag for Jake Irvin, I want nothing to do with him. He's got a 16% K rate with a 13% walk rate, 54% strike one. This team is very patient. He's going to walk these guys, put them on base, and they're going to end up circling because of the high contact rates and low strikeout rates uh, from pretty much every one of these guys right, against, um, let's see here, I want to, 
show you a quick little what we've got here. Um, against right-handed pitching, look at the aggregate numbers here against righties, right? And these are all weighted for number of plate appearances, right? 226 ISO, 368 WOBA, and a 284 average. That's pretty damn good numbers, right? 130 WRC plus with an 18.5% K rate, right? 34% hard. This is a, and this is every one of these guys in the lineup, they get the baseball on a line with an aggregate buck 10 ground ball to fly ball. Good line drive rate, great soft contact rates in aggregate, really good hard contact rates too. Super balanced. And the green numbers are really what should jump out at us here. Of course, that's a Corbin Carroll. 175 WRC plus for him. 303 against righties. 435 Woba with a 346 ISO. Are you kidding me? So really, really hard to attack this team with a below average arm. 87.5% contact rate for Jake Irvin. This is not a super tiny sample. He's got eight starts, right? But he puts too many people on base. He pitches to way too much contact. Can't throw it past anybody. So give me everybody, including the righties. I like getting to some Lourdes here at 4,100. Even some Manny Rivera. Doesn't have a lot of power necessarily. But give me some Carson Kelly. Even a, a super cheap Nick Ahmed. I think that's okay. Even though he's not great against right-handers necessarily. Um, this is an upside spot for him to make some contact. And he's 2,200. Let's do it. Okay, so I want to get to a good bit of offense here. And I'm probably going to leave pitching mostly on the shelf uh, as much as I can. Okay, let's move on. Boston and Minnesota. The Twins are going to be the other really popular stack today. Boston, not so much, because they get Joe Ryan uh, on the other side. And he's the guy I want to play at 25% ownership. I don't want to eat 40% or even 50% on Snell and Aaron Nola, because I don't trust Snell. And in this matchup, I don't really trust Nola. I'd rather just play Joe Ryan, even though this is a bad matchup, too, against the Red Sox. Um, we'll get to who they're playing around with on the mound uh, in a sec. 11,000 for Joe. That's really the only thing that's going to prevent us from getting to a lot of him. Um, and that's what's really keeping his ownership down. Oh, obviously, it's the matchup too, right? But for the most part, projection-wise, up at the top, let's pop back over to main um, you know, overview page here. There, everybody's pretty much in the same range, right? So a lower projection for a, high, a more expensive guy when the projection delta is only a point and a half between... You know him and and Aaron Nola, for example. Um, does that warrant a 15 or 20 percent ownership delta that you're likely to see here? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it does, right? Because both Boston and, and Atlanta are very difficult lineups to get through. I would say at the moment Atlanta is quite a bit more difficult, right? And Joe Ryan, frankly, like he doesn't have the same questions that Aaron Nola has in the arsenal, and he throws a better pitch. Right, he gets a lot more value out of his off speed than Aaron Nola does. Aaron Nola's changeups break even. Joe Ryan's get two and a half outs above the field, right? And that's on a splitter, which is historically a very, very good pitch. So it's kind of hard, relatively, to do this with a splitter, get this sort of outsized uh, production out of it relative to other good splitters in the in the league. You know, Kevin Gosman's got a really good split, et cetera, et cetera, than it is for a, a raw changeup. Right. So that kind of puts Joe Ryan's off speed pitch way, way ahead of Aaron Nola's off speed pitch. And then you get into the the breaking stuff. Well, obviously, he's got the, the bad slider sort of sweeper nonsense that he's jacking around with here to break even curveball himself. But this is just kind of like a show me. He, he throws this like once a start kind of deal. For the most part, though, it's the four-seam command that really helps Joe Ryan establish and get to this really, really good split. Now, he's got a pretty pronounced strikeout delta, strikeout rate delta, I should say, uh, two lefties, right? Just 21% here, he's elite against the right side, right? We really don't want a lot of, um, really any righties here from Boston. I mean, they've only got, what, two, three in the lineup that they're could be screwing around with maybe a fourth uh, with a Connor Wong or a Kike down at the but you know something like that. Um, the guys at the top they're not going to strike out. Jaron Duran will, so I'm not super worried about him. But like a, um, a Rafi Devers, I'm kind of worried about him, of course. Alex Verdugo, 
is actually not going to be in the lineup today. Um, he They just put him on the bereavement list, so he won't even be in there. It'll likely be Duran leading off. Um, so there's a little bit of upside for Joe Ryan to pick through him because he strikes out a crap load. Uh, but you still got to get through Justin Turner, Rafi Devers, Masataki Yoshida, right? Uh, everybody else, Adam Duvall, Tristan Casas, and the guys down at the bottom, they're going to whiff a little bit. So I think this is a fine spot to go after Boston with what I think is the best arm on the on the day here. Um, and he's at a very attainable ownership figure here. He doesn't walk anybody. He stays off of the barrel totally. Now, the, we do have a question against right-handers, right? He's a fly baller, heavy, heavy fly baller with some hard contact. That gives me a little bit of worry. But that's really just Justin Turner and Adam Duvall territory that I'm super concerned with. Um, but overall, I think everything's fine with Joe Ryan. I really, like, he needs slider value. This is awful, okay? And this does put me a bit more on to Aaron Nola in this respect, right? Because Aaron Nola's curveball, when it's good, it's still one of the best curveballs in baseball. When Joe Ryan's slider is good, it's break-even at best. At best, right? It's still giving up a lot to the field here. So that can put Boston in play, right? Because if the slider is bad here, that means Joe Ryan's only a two-pitch guy. Unfortunately for Boston, that you know his two pitches, even if he is only a two-pitch guy, are elite here, right? This four-seamer is one of the best four-seamers for a starting pitcher in baseball. Same thing with the split. So it's a hard matchup for Boston, but I also think that given some of these hitters, Rafi Devers, Yoshida in particular, Adam Duvall maybe, um, Fading Boston is probably not a very good idea because you're still going to get some leverage on the field, right? So some short stacks of Boston, I think, are very much in play here um, going after Joe Ryan. But I want to get to a lot of him as much as I can and a lot of the Twins because the Red Sox here, we're not sure what they're going to do. Uh, MLB has Justin Garza listed as the opener here. They did just call up um, Brandon Walter, who is just kind of a, a journeyman, upper minors type of left-hander for Boston. He'll be making his debut today. He is going to come up. They're just not sure whether they're going to open him or bring him in behind an opener. Um, so as of right now, it is Garza coming in. He won't go very long. He'd probably just go an inning, and then it would likely be Brandon Walter. But he's, he's got dreadful numbers in the upper minors this season. 630 ERA with a buck sixty-five, buck seventy whip nearly. Um you know, he is a starter, and he is stretched out enough to go a few innings here. And he is a left-hander, and the Twins are awful, awful, awful against left-handers. So that would take me off of them a little bit. They're going to be the second most popular team, and I think they are still... They, I, I think they should be, right? Um, second to the, uh, the D-backs here. Average creation offense, of course, but they're still going to hit for a little bit of power, and they're very well-priced. So that's what's really popping their ownership. Um, Carlos Correa, their lineup did just come out. Let's see if we can actually get a uh, quick lineup refresh. Don't have Boston yet, but uh, there is Minnesota. And here's Correa here, 4,300. Right, Alex Kirilov, you could play him. That's fine. At 3,200, he's got a lot of pop. But you see these ownership figures, right? They're going to be very popular um, in, in most instances <clears throat> and in most tournaments uh, Buxton of course he's going to be super popular even though he kind of stinks but he's 5,000 this is a good price I like Royce Lewis at 34 here Ryan Jeffers 25 I think he's a fine catcher piece too but once again you know you're gonna have to balance ownership um, so that's what would keep me off at the moment we're only seeing 15 percent on Carlos Correa uh, I think that's one of the better shortstop plays of the day up there right up there with um Geraldo Perdomo from Arizona. So I want to get to the Twins here and go after whoever the Red Sox are going to throw on the mound. Um, and maybe a, a couple you know, short Red Sox pieces here. Nobody's going to have them um, except me, I think. I think it's a pretty good play. Oakland, Cleveland, J.P. Sears. I want to get to some of this, I think. Um, 6,800. I think J.P. Sears is a respectable arm. Uh, now, don't tell anybody I said this, but he's certainly the best um Oakland Athletic that they've got on a regular basis that is not on the DL. Average four-seamer, slightly below average, and that keeps the changeup from eking out a lot of value. It's actually a plus change for him, 
but since he doesn't throw all that hard, just 93, changeup's going to be you know pretty marginal if the four-seamer is marginal, right? Three-pitch guy with a slider, throws a slider a lot, and he's got fine metrics. You know, for the most part, he's got a, I mean, against right-handers, this is a pretty damn good number, 25.5% K rate. He gives up some pop, yes, and a lot of fly balls, yes. He gets on the barrel. That's the main problem with J.P. Sears. He doesn't, he throws it past them, and he's got some whiffs, and it's not a lot of average, but when he gets on the barrel, he pipes this four-seamer, he leaves this changeup up, and he, he throws a slider a lot, too, and he just hangs it, and, like, it it gets right over the middle of the plate, uh, and that translates to a 13% barrel rate, right? So he doesn't walk people, which is good. So it's going to be hard for Cleveland to just hit the baseball out, number one, because they don't hit the baseball out, right? 133 ISO, even though they've been a little bit better recently, and certainly in this series, they're still just a 90 WRC plus creation offense. They don't strike out a lot, which is obviously going to take us off of J.P. Sears, but it's going to put me right back on with a 12.5% ownership rate. I think he can survive against this offense, even though it's pretty dangerous. He's got good numbers against righties, less so against the lefties, but this is a short sample. I'm not super worried about that. Um, what I am obviously worried about is the is the contact rate, but it's only at 77%. It's not 87.5% like Jake Irvin here, right? 77% is a workable number, but, yeah, I'm super concerned about this high barrel rate here. This is not attractive. Um, four to quarter ERA with expected metrics right in the same range, three quarters of a run higher, whatever. This is a smaller ballpark than Oakland, of course, right? Um, so, you know, we can't really fade Cleveland. They're also very cheap, but should they be the third most popular team on the day today? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, there's other better offenses, and J.P. Sears is not a total gas can. So I think I'd like to probably get to some of him. You're going to need some cheaper arms if you want to just click in the expensive offenses, and he's one of them that can make it happen. Logan Allen, on the other side, he's going to see most of the ownership, as we talked about in the mid-range here, 7,900 for him. Um, I, I like playing him, but I hate playing left-handers against Oakland in general, even though he's a bad team. Okay, we do have their lineup as well. 97 WRC plus 23% strikeout rate. They will create, right? 21% line drive rate, neutral ground ball to fly ball elsewhere. They're not going to hit it over the wall, similar to Cleveland. Um, you know, And these guys are mega cheap. I want to play some Mysterio Ruiz. 35 bags from this guy. He's only 12.5%. I'm going to play him every day at this number against a left-hander and against most lefties in baseball. Not a lot of power upside for him necessarily, right? We'll scroll over all the way to the left-handed numbers. But he's still got a 133 WRC+, plus, 311 average, right? Just a 135 ISO, but he doesn't strike out, right? He's going to get on base, unfortunately, with only a 2.5% walk rate. It's not great. Make some soft contact. That's not good. But we can attack with this because he's got so much speed up at the top of the lineup. Right, and you'll see that of course Brent Rooker popping pretty hard there as well. Carlos Perez hits 333 in a short sample this season, but a 131 WRC plus with a low strikeout rate himself. Where are the strikeouts? You got two, three spots, call it, if you would consider Shea four spots here, but outside of that, they have an aggregate 20 and 21 percent strikeout rate for this lineup against left-handed pitching this year. Right, not a lot of power, of course, so that is going to Definitely keep Logan Allen in play, but should we, from a strikeout perspective, really be going after 45-50% of our teams with Logan Allen at just a 22% aggregate K rate himself? I'm not sure, right? Not sure. Attackable figures here, 290 average allowed against righties, 156 ISO, just the 21% strikeout rate, 35% hard contact. That's attackable. So I think I want to get to a couple of these righties over here from Oakland. They're off the board. Right, and that's kind of hard to do on a five-game slate a lot of the time. We did just get Cleveland's lineup as well. Um, let's see if they have come in yet, and I haven't quite refreshed, so not just yet. But I like some offense here. I want to play Logan Allen definitely uh, because I love this arm. Right, I really like the upside. Love the strike one. He's super efficient, and he's got a good split himself. Uh, but he's got some question marks, right? And he'll still get. He's still a young arm. He just made his debut this season, right? Um, 
So I want to go after that a little bit with low ownership on some of these very cheap Oakland pieces, Ruiz, Carlos Perez, Brent Rooker in particular, even though Rooker's really been slumping recently. So give me some pitching and a little bit of offense. I think everybody's in play here. Last game, San Diego and the Giants. Yeah, Blake Snell's in play, 37%. Okay, fine. I, you know, like if I click in somebody, it's probably going to be Blake Snell as opposed to Aaron Nola. Um, I don't want to play either of them at this ownership figure. Like, let's be clear about that. But it's five games late. I'm going to kind of have to. I hate the walk rate still. I talk about this every start with Blake Snell. And I hate when he's popular, but we don't really have a choice uh, on just a five-gamer. The strikeout stuff for Snell has been pretty damn good recently. He's had very good outings. Um, and that, and that's awesome. But he still has trouble with the walk rate, right? It's to both sides of the plate, and he still gives up a little bit of pop two right-handers, 150 ISO. He's got a 181 X ISO in aggregate this season. That's a big and attackable figure, 35% aggregate hard contact, right? So despite a very high strikeout rate, I mean, this is why I would rather play Snell. I trust him, don't tell anybody I said this, a little bit more against the Giants because they're bad, right? They strike out 26% clip, 101 WRC plus for them, right? 27% hard contact, buck 40 ISO against lefties. So they're very attackable here, and this is why I'd rather play him than Aaron Nola um, if I had to choose between the two at roughly the same ownership figures. Just give me Snell instead, uh, even though he's got his warts also. High strand rate, ERA pointing upward in terms of uh, you know where he should be, and a high walk rate. I hate this walk rate. And I hate eating high price tag and high ownership on a guy that is going to elevate his own pitch count. Makes it really difficult for me to play him. Um, but he's attackable, certainly. So if you want to get to some off-the-board giant stacks as well, but like by all means, uh, I'm like I said, I'm probably going to have everybody today. And I think that's warranted. Austin Slater, they might have Luis Matos up at the top of the lineup. Tyro at 52. I think this is playable. J.D. Davis, 42, playable as well. Patty Bailey, he'll hit from both sides. Casey Schmidt, they can go right-handed heavy, you know, and the Giants like to play their platoon game. So I think having a couple of Giants pieces and some exposure somewhere, attacking a 12.5% walk rate and a 10% barrel rate for Blake Snell and a very high pitch count is, you know, in only, what, five, five and a third here. Uh, I think that's pretty equitable on a five-gamer. Alex Wood on the mound for the Giants, 6,600. I like this price tag. I hate this matchup. He's also one of these guys I'm probably just going to X um, because I don't trust that he's going to be able to go more than four four innings here. Uh, this is a bad matchup. I don't like this stuff. He throws a, a two-seamer, right? That's his only fastball. Has a change, okay, but it's a six-mile-an-hour delta here, seven-mile-an-hour. Like, not great. And... This lineup over here in San Diego really heating up. This is a day game in San Francisco, so the baseball's going to fly a little bit because they've got a 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing out to left. And even though it's only 60, 65 degrees there, it's still a day game. And the baseball flies a little bit when, since they brought the fences in at, uh, at Oracle. So 22.5% K rate, buck 12 WRC+, plus, 195 ISO for this team with some walks. Now that Soto is heated up, um, you can't even really like totally fade him anymore, even at a 5,900 price tag. 6,500 for Tatis, they're really just kind of middling, even given their very expensive price tags. 52 for Manny, 5K for Bogarts. Uh, they're middling in value, and I think that makes them pretty attractive on a five-game slate here, um, because you're going to see all of the ownership go to Arizona, Minnesota. In terms of you know equitable stacks, I think the the Padres here are in a pretty damn good spot. He might be one of these guys, despite an attractive price tag. I don't think he's going to be able to go deep enough into a game here. He's also got a 10% walk rate, um, so I'm not super attracted there. He's always been really good against lefties, so I'll pro I'll definitely stay off Trent Grisham. I never play him. Probably stay off of Jay Cronenworth here, um, but uh, you know fading Soto I think is a pretty big mistake uh, when he is seeing the baseball like this. He's got such a high on base percentage. He'll steal a couple of bases here or there, too. And it makes him very equitable in stacks. And what's definitely the downside of a platoon, but Alex Wood's not going to blow it past him necessarily, right? Um, so I want to play some Padres here. I think they're a pretty good tournament stack. Same thing with the Giants a little bit. And like I said, I'm going to get to probably everybody here today. And 
because I think everybody is in play to one degree or another uh, outside of a couple of the mostly just these pitchers here in this Washington game. I don't want anything to do with either of these guys. And I'll probably just leave Alex Wood on the shelf as well. And I'm not playing either, um, whatever they do, it, whether it's what Brandon Walter um, opening or Garza, you obviously can't play or anything like that. So I'm going to sprinkle in pretty much everybody. And I think everybody's in play. This is just a five game slate. So uh, we're going to try and get this out ASAP here. Um, projections are loaded to the site and to Saverson for those of you with the Saverson package. And so keep an eye up, eye out for updates now that we've got lineups rolling in, slate starting uh, here shortly. So uh, good luck to everybody on this short Thursday.